So I have something called obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Um, my wife kindly says I am mission oriented. Um, when, I, when I get a notion in my head, it's kind of hard for me sometimes to turn the off switch. Um, Brooke could rattle off. Um, um, really, Brooke would be saying amen to that too. I mean, uh, she, she could tell you just a number of instances where that is the case. One that readily comes to my mind is when we first took our, our, our sons to Disney. Um, being mission oriented, I am a planner. I feel like if you are going to go somewhere, you need to get the most out of it. And so um, the way to do that is to optimize your time. So I mapped out an itinerary um, through Magic Kingdom that even included when we would take bathroom breaks. Um, I, I shared the plan with my wife and it did not sit well with her at all. She said that when I've had two C-sections, I could determine when we stopped for the restroom. Um, I, but I, I would tell you that I, I find almost as much joy planning a trip as I do going on the trip. I'm, I'm, I like to research where to go. I, I like to research um, when we're going to go. I, like to research exactly what we're going to do when we get there. And many of you may be sitting here thinking right now, I knew he was strange, but wow. Um, and, and yet as weird as I might be, even if you're not OCD or mission oriented, we all prepare for various and sundry things. I mean, if you are married, did you prepare for your wedding? If you have children, did you prepare for when you would bring them home from the hospital? Do you prepare for your children's birthday parties and getting older? Do you prepare for retirement? I think you get the point. We do prepare, but the season of Advent provides a reminder about what we should most prepare and it is a reminder that the prophetic text that we read from in Isaiah 40 lays out for us. The Heidelberg Catechism uses an interesting word for the guilt that our sin causes. The Catechism calls it debt. Because we belong to God, we owe Him our time, we owe Him our energy, we owe Him our service, we owe Him our total obedience. Compare it to owing God, if you will, a million dollars a day. And on the first day, we hardly think about God, and so on the next day, we owe Him a second million plus interest. In only a few months, we would make the national debt look like pocket change. The burden of our sin is enough to break our backs. It is enough to buckle our knees. And yet God has made a way to put an end to that burden. Isaiah declares that our hard service has been completed, that our sin has been paid for. But how? The perfect tense of verse 2 suggests a promise that flies well into the future. The one who receives double at the Lord's hands for all our sins is Jesus. God prepares the way for Christ to deliver us. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 11 is a gospel presentation, plain and simple. Do not mistakenly believe that the gospel is only a New Testament revelation. The Lord is telling his covenantal people who are still in exile that their deliverance is coming. Yes, that deliverance would first appear when Cyrus and the Persians literally release Israel from Babylonian captivity, but that is only one additional step in what is unfolding in God's redemptive promises, what's being fulfilled. You need to understand that the Old Testament is a story of preparation. 
The prophets did not simply speak of a coming age. They spoke of a long expected Messiah. They spoke of an unfolding history which culminates in the birth of Jesus Christ. When you read the opening chapter of the Gospel of Luke, take note of how Luke begins his account a year prior to Christ's birth. You find an old priest, Zechariah, and his wife Elizabeth, and you find a miraculous birth similar to that of Abraham and Sarah with their son Isaac. In Genesis chapter 22, we learn that Isaac was a promised son who prefigures the promised son of God. In Luke chapter 1, we learn that John the Baptist was a forerunner to that promised son of God. It's no small coincidence that the silence of the Lord is broken in speaking to Zechariah for the son born to he and Elizabeth would fulfill the last Old Testament prophetic word from Malachi 4, verse 5. During the intertestamental period, when the Lord's voice had fallen silent, a people group called the Essenes moved out into the desert to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. It's, they did this in response clearly to the scroll of Isaiah that we read from in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Literally, such a process meant to clear the path of any obstacles that would prevent someone from going from point A to point B. Prophetically, it meant getting ready for the coming Messiah. John the Baptist was an Essene. He was a cousin to Jesus. And in Luke 1.41, he leaps in his mother's womb at the news of Mary's pregnancy. Just as the Holy Spirit had prepared the way for the birth of Christ through the Virgin Mary, John would soon prepare the way for the ministry of Christ. We read in Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. Only Luke's Opening verses in his gospel show the preparation of how John ushers in the ministry of Jesus that it actually stretches back through Zerubbabel, Nathan, David, the tribe of Judah, Abraham, Noah, Seth, and Adam. We cannot go back any farther than that. The preparation for the Messiah's birth comes through the trustworthiness of God's Word. The promises that we talked about last Sunday are 100% certain. The promises are not like flowers or grass that wither. And the definitive promises of God's Word find their yes and their amen in Christ. Jesus is the tender shepherd of Isaiah 40, verse 11, that God the Father would send. He is the one who was born to pick up the lambs to carry them home. Jesus says in John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Yet in what may seem like a contradiction, the tender shepherd king, the one who dies for his sheep, is also the mighty warrior of Isaiah 40, verse 10, who comes to vanquish the enemy. It is no contradiction because it takes unparalleled strength to bear the sins of the world, to endure the pains of hell, to experience separation from the Father so that we can be delivered from the burden of our sin. 
Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So John the Baptist's message still cries out from the wilderness for us to prepare our hearts and to clear the way for Jesus to enter into our lives. This Christmas, we need to clear our minds from the guck and the muck that so easily build up and interfere with our getting from point A to point B in our spiritual walk. Mama said a little girl, my Sunday school teacher tells me that this world is only a place where God lets us live a little while in order to prepare us for a better world through Jesus. But mother, she continued, I don't see anyone preparing. I see you preparing to go into the country. I see Aunt Elizabeth preparing to go out for dinner, but I don't see anyone preparing for living with Jesus. Why isn't anyone getting ready? Here then is a practical challenge for you this season. Maybe make out an entirely different type of Christmas list and post it somewhere where you can readily see it, where you can be readily reminded of it. Instead of writing out what you want to get, either for yourself or for others, write out how you will prepare for the coming of Christ, how you will prepare for Christ to take more control in your life. I will prepare physically for Christ's coming by eating a more healthy diet and finding more time to exercise. I will prepare relationally for Christ's coming by setting aside work in order to love my family better and by treating others more gently. I will prepare emotionally for Christ's coming by finding reasons to be thankful rather than reasons to complain. I will prepare financially for Christ's coming by giving more generously to the church and to friends who may be in need. I will prepare spiritually for Christ's coming by spending more time alone with God in study and through prayer. How will we prepare for Christ's coming? Each day we should be preparing as if it's the day that we will go to meet Jesus. For just as Old Testament believers lived in expectancy of the Messiah's first coming, we live in expectancy of the Messiah's second coming. Ancient Corinth staged the popular Isthmian Games. It hosted many events, but the relay race was the most popular. The competitors would line up rows of four, and competitors would see ahead of them the next group, and then ahead of them the next group, and ahead of them the next group. And so they would each hold at the starting line a torch, and they would begin to run with that lit torch, and when they would get to the next person on their relay group, they would hand the torch off until the torch had gone from person to person on the relay team and they crossed the finish line. It made the Greeks coin a phrase, let those who have the light pass it on. The celebration of Christmas ought to remind us to prepare others by passing on the light until it's our time to hand over the torch and go be with Jesus. We announce good tidings. We announce that God the Father, through the preparations and the operations of the Holy Spirit, sent God the Son to deliver us from sin's burden. Zion, <laughs> Zion's place is never to be simply a recipient of grace. The place of Zion is to be a messenger of the grace that we have been given, the good news of grace that we have received. 
The mission of Winstanley Baptist Church is to love the Metro East and the surrounding world like Christ. Have you ever considered why the church is given pronouns of she and her? For one, it is because we are preparing ourselves as the bride of Christ. But secondly, it is because the witness of the church helps give birth to new spiritual sons and daughters. What is our witness? Are we taking the good news of Jesus to prepare the way in other people's hearts so that they might be born again in Jesus? The translation of our Bible, you bring good tidings, is as one word in the Hebrew manuscript, and that Greek equivalent is the word evangelist. Evangelism is speaking to others about God and his salvation promise, realizing that the Lord will deliver anyone, the Lord will deliver anyone who prepares the way for Christ to come into his heart. A friend of mine in ministry told me about a man who goes into a few different bars each Christmas Eve. He will walk up to the bartender, he will ask the bartender for permission to read something. And once that bartender says he can, he will open up his Bible to Luke chapter 2, and all he will do is read Luke 2, 1 through 20. He reads to those who think that maybe they can find some kind of escape in a bottle. The true way to be relieved from their burden. The true way to find deliverance for their souls. If you have already prepared room in your heart for Jesus, then cry out, call out, shout out, Behold, our God, his name is Jesus. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And go tell it on the mountain that he's coming again. Amen. Observe Advent by preparing the way for the Lord. If you have already prepared room for Jesus in your heart, do that. But today, if you have not yet prepared room for Christ in your heart, won't you let him take residence today? Won't you let him in? Pray with me. Lord, When we think about the line to see Jesus in our world right now, it seems to be growing less and less in length. More and more people are dismissing the truth, Christ, of your coming. We no longer celebrate who you are. Instead, we celebrate all that the trappings of this world might give. Today, we pray that we would take the torch that we have been given, that we would go into a world shrouded with darkness, and that we would shine your light, that we would tell of the goodness of your coming, that we would proclaim the grace that has been given through that coming, and that we would encourage men, women, boys, and girls to prepare their hearts room for Jesus. Christ, use your church to be a torch, a light, that we would go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Grant us grace now, I pray, here in this, your church, among your church, to be faithful 
and what you've called us to do. Christ Jesus, be glorified. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is from hymn 176, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. I would ask and encourage you as we stand, as we sing together, to pay close attention to the words of this beautiful hymn and let it soak deep into your hearts and into your minds. Oh, come thou long expected Jesus. If you need today to make a decision for Christ, the altar is open. Let's stand together as we sing.